Welcome back, everybody. To the second session of today. This session will be about uh, the politics of division, Marxism versus identity politics. Uh, as you know, in the current period, identity politics uh, are uh, particularly in vogue. And so it is important uh, to discuss the origins of these uh, ideas. and the position of the Marxism on it. The lead off will be given by Ilva Weinberg. She's a leading activist of the Revolution. That is the Swedish section of the IMT. Eva will speak uh, for about 90 minutes. Then we will have a break until uh, 7.30 British time. Then we'll have some interventions. And finally, uh, the sum up to finish the session at nine British time. As you can see, we are having some pauses while we are speaking. That is to give time for the translations. If you need the translation, you can find uh, all the available languages. They are uh, 12 uh, on the left of the screen. As you, as you can find uh, the whole program of our uh, Marxist University. You just select the star. Now, just before uh, leaving the uh, to, to Ilva, An announcement, uh, you probably already heard it uh, in the previous session. That is about uh, uh, Comrade Amin from the Pakistani se section of the IMT. who on um, uh, July the 14th was abducted, abducted by, from his home by the Rangers. That is a paramilitary group in Pakistan. And in many cases, victims of the Rangers have been tortured. And many have lost their lives. So we appeal to all those watching
to hold protests against these crimes of the Pakistani state. You can write letters and emails to Pakistani embassies in different countries. in a personal capacity or on behalf of your organizations. A video and an article have been published on the marxist.com website. And this can be posted on social media with the hashtag release Amin and stop state abductions in Pakistan. Okay, thank you for your attention. Now I leave uh, to Ilva to lead off this uh, session. Okay, I'm good to go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alessio. Well, um, comrades, take a look at the world around you. Police violence against black people in the US. Border controls and shots fired against refugees. The murdering of women, femicides in Mexico. This is the system we live in. A world where people face harassment, violence. Being seen as a second class citizen. Because of your gender, sexuality, the color of your skin. Your ethnicity or your religion. Despite all that talk about gender equality from the leaders of the world, the situation for women and girls is not getting better but worse. In the world of the rich and the famous, It's hailed as a great step forward when a woman becomes prime minister. Or a Hollywood celebrity gives a speech on gender equality when winning an Oscar. In the real world, the oppression women face condemn a majority of them to a life of poverty and discrimination. Sixty percent of the world's chronically hungry are women and girls.
And women make up more than two thirds of the world's 796 million illiterate people. In the real world, 50,000 women across the world are killed by a member of their own family every year. So how do we struggle against depression? In this talk, I'll be discussing two opposing views. The views of Marxism and the views of identity politics. Now, for Marxists, the struggle against oppression is connected to the struggle against capitalism. Because all oppressions are rooted in class society. Oppression under capitalism is a mechanism used in order to split the working class and the poor. Fermenting sexism, racism, homophobia, and other reactionary ideas. Capitalists and politicians pit different sectors of the masses against each other. So that workers see each other as the enemy instead of the capitalists and the capitalist system itself. And we see this today, how reactionary politicians like Trump, Bolsonaro, and Boris Johnson try to rally a part of the most politically backward sectors of the masses against trans people women's right to abortion immigrants to keep workers from uniting to keep them from struggling against capitalism. Oppression is also very profitable for the capitalists. Immigrants and other parts of the working class are paid less And that puts a pressure on the other more well-paid uh, parts of the working class. To lower their wages and accept reduced working conditions. In order to not be replaced. By lowering wages for one sector of the working class, the capitalists can therefore lower the wages for all workers.
Now, the way to fight oppression, we say, is through class unity. The stronger the unity of the working classes, then the harder it is to use oppression to divide the workers. And the more support a movement against oppression has among the broader layers of the working class, And the more the working class takes an active role in leading that struggle, and the more that that movement threatens the very system, the more gains can be won. This is because of the working class position in capitalist production. Capitalism is based on the exploitation of the workers for profit. And this means that the working class can organize and attack capitalists where it hurts. Strikes that stop production means capitalists lose profits. And that gives the working class a power that other groups in society does not have. It's not an accident, for example, that the biggest gains made for women in Sweden, where I'm from, which is the same in many other countries, were a product of the class struggle. For example, the right to vote, women's right to vote, uh, was won in Sweden. In the revolutionary period of 1917 and 1918. And that forced the Swedish ruling class to make concessions Since they were scared that the revolution would overthrow the entire capitalist system as it had done in Russia. Now, the struggle against oppression is part of the struggle against capitalism. because the socialist revolution cannot succeed unless workers unite. It is essential, for example, that workers understand that it is the capitalist system that is to blame. for unemployment and cuts. And not immigrants as politicians want workers to believe. It is essential that they understand the need to struggle together against oppression
if they want to fight for their own liberation. And it is precisely in periods of great class struggles and more so in revolutions When workers understand that they have much more to gain by uniting, and that the capitalists are trying to use oppression to pit them against each other. It's then they learn who the real enemy is. It's in a revolution when workers on a mass scale begins to question all that society has tried to teach them. And this we've seen time and time again in revolutions. Women who participated in the 2011 revolution in Egypt said that during the high point of the revolution, women could be outside all night in the Tahrir Square of Cairo without being harassed. As one woman said who participated, she said, no one sees you as a woman here. No one sees you as a man. We're all united in our desire for democracy and freedom. Also, the majority of the working class of the world are women or part of some other oppressed group. that is on top of the exploitation and oppression that all workers face as workers. So the idea that a socialist revolution would not also mean a struggle against oppression It's quite ludicrous. Because when workers move to change society, they put forward all their issues, all their troubles. and struggle for a total liberation from all exploitation and oppression. So every period of great class struggles and revolutions also awakens the struggle against oppression. And we've seen this during the last decade. With Black Lives Matter in the US. The mass movement that we saw this year against Modi's citizenship law. Which was aimed against Muslims in, in India. The 5.3 million 
that came out during the women's strike uh, in Spain in 2018. We've seen, ma we've seen massive movements against oppression around the world in recent times. Because we're living in a period of a deep crisis of capitalism that has provoked class struggle and revolutions. Now, feminists often claim that Marxists don't care to struggle against oppression. Nor for any reforms that would improve the lives of oppressed workers. They say we're only waiting for the revolution. But on the contrary, it's only in the day-to-day -day struggle uh, for improved living conditions and against injustice and counter-reforms Sorry, lost the translation. Sorry, I'm back. Um, so it's so it's only in the struggle against injustice, counter and counter reforms. that workers can learn how to struggle against capitalism. Mm. But what we do explain is that you simply cannot reform away oppression. And that there can be no collaboration with the ruling class in the struggle against oppression. The capitalists, no matter if they're men or women, black or white, gay or straight, profit from oppression as capitalists. and any attempts to collaborate with the ruling class or their political representatives will always end up with them derailing the movement or trying to derail the movement anyway. into something that does not threaten the capitalist system or the profits of the capitalists. So as Marxists, we have a clear understanding of how to struggle against oppression. And how we can abolish it. But the forces of Marxism are still a minority. Too small to be able to offer our advice on how to struggle to the broader masses. And to lead mass movements.
most to seek ways to fight oppression. Encounter the ideas of identity politics. Such as intersectionality, queer theory, and different strands of feminism like radical feminism. Now, identity politics is all based on the idea that all struggle against oppression has to be led by those directly suffering under that specific oppression. Mm. It's women who must lead the fight against patriarchy. It's trans people who must lead the fight against transphobia. It's black and people of color who must lead the fight against racism. For them, the struggle against oppression are all separate struggles. And they understand oppression as a structure more or less separated from capitalism. They say that women's oppression is based on patriarchy. A structure of men's domination over women that does not completely rely on the capitalist system. Racism is due to white privilege that is not based on the capitalist system. But what is white privilege? What is patriarchy? The dominant trend within identity politics is to understand oppression as a result of a series of unfortunate ideas or norms, as they say. The struggle against oppression for them is therefore first and foremost a struggle to convince people and society to stop having these oppressive ideas and behaviors. Now, this is what Marxists call idealism. Which in philosophical terms means that you view society, the way that the world operates, as a consequence of the ideas, morals, or norms people have. Marxism holds the opposite view. As materialists, we understand that the ideas people have, the ideas, the dominant ideas of society, is shaped by how society is built. The 
The task, therefore, is to change society. For example, we explain that the ideas of racism arose to justify slavery and colonialism and exists today to justify imperialist exploitation and racist discrimination. Women's oppression, we explain, arose alongside class society. Where women went from being equal and well respected within the old egalitarian hunting and gathering societies. to being subordinated to men within the family. It was the rise of private property in men's primary field of work in agriculture which led to the relegation of the position of women in society. And in order to maintain their pri private property and pass it on to their heirs, men forced monogamy upon women. so that they would know that their children was really their children. And thus men came to dominate women who were now confined to the home. And it was on this basis that the control of women and their sexuality in the family arose. Under capitalism, many women have gained a greater economic independence from men. by being drawn into production, becoming part of the working class and making a wage for herself. But capitalism is still dependent on the family. And the domestic labor of women in the household. in order for new workers to be brought up for the capitalists to exploit. Women are paid less, work more part-time. And are therefore still economically dependent on men. And as long as that economic inequality uh, exists, as long as society rests on the family, then men will have power over women. And with that also follows violence, harassment, and sexist stereotypes.
These ideas reflect the real world we live in. But it is the ruling class that spreads prejudice and hatred against oppressed minorities. Which workers are not immune to? Through the media, uh, through the state, throughout society. And oppressions are concrete things that can't simply be educated away. An American company that exploits the natural resources and cheap labor of a poor country. does not stop being exploitation and a mechanism which upholds the racist world order. If that company gets a black CEO or calls itself anti-racist or whatever. You cannot simply convince the big monopolies of the world to stop exploiting the poor countries. You have to overthrow the imperialist system we live in. It's not a matter of prejudice, but of the way society is built. So we say we have to struggle for a society, a socialist society. Where oppression will not be upheld by the system. Only by getting rid of the material basis uh, for oppression. Can we lay the basis for prejudice, harassment, and violence to gradually disappear? But identity politics, on the other hand, says that those who are to blame for the existence of oppression are those who are not oppressed in the same way. Men are responsible for women's oppression and benefit from it. White people are resp responsible for racism and benefit from it. Heterosexual are to blame for homophobia and so on. As the intersectional academic Francis Kendall put it, she said, any of us who has race privilege, which all white people do, and therefore the power to put our prejudices into law, is racist by definition because we benefit from a racist system.
Feminist Heidi Hartman says the same on women's oppression. In her text, The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism from 1979. where she says that men have a material interest in women's continued oppression. Fight against oppression is therefore for them uh, a struggle of women against men. Black and people of color against white. trans against so-called cis people, that is non-trans. Those who do not suffer from the same oppression are privileged and as they say, must uh, check their privileges. Which means question your privileges. And they can only be supporters or allies to those who must lead the struggle. And that means that the majority of those who are the oppressors are workers and poor around the world. And the struggle is one of worker against worker, oppressed against oppressed. Now, the way that identity politics puts the blame on uh, the so-called privileged workers actually mirrors the mechanisms of maintaining oppression by capitalism. Because capitalists want white workers to think they benefit from racism. They want men to think they benefit from women's oppression. They want workers to be pitted against each other. And identity politics reinforces this saying the same thing. Now, for example, some feminists in Sweden have claimed that the more well-paid uh, male workers in, in male-dominated sectors should not go on strike. Because they're already so well-paid and privileged. But it's not women workers in the public sector with lower wages that would benefit from these workers not going on strike and demanding more in wages. It's the capitalists that these workers work for. And it's not the male workers that want to keep down the wages of women workers. In the public sector. 
It is the politicians that are eager to defend capitalist profits. by spending less on welfare. That do not want to increase the wages of nurses, care workers and others. The day to day advantages that some workers get from not being uh, doubly oppressed. is nothing compared to what they would gain if they united and struggled for more. So for us, it's not a struggle between different allied groups for their own interests, but a common struggle for common interests. Now, identity politics started to get prominence towards the end of the 80s and during the 90s. Now, this was a period of an ebb in the class struggle, the era of Reagan and Thatcher. the fall of the Soviet Union and the supposed final defeat of communism. The academics who had witnessed the great movements of the 60s and 70s drew the conclusion of the impossibility of the workers defeating capitalism. While socialism in their minds seemed to be no way forward, capitalism also did not seem to offer a brighter future for humanity. They drew the most pessimistic conclusions and became advocates of different variants of postmodernism. which is the philosophical roots of identity politics. Those still sometimes using Marxist phraseology, these ideas were used to challenge and wipe out support for Marxism in academia. at the great satisfaction of the bourgeoisie. And from academia, it spread into the left and the labor movement at a time when the labor movement was emptied of workers. as a result from the ebb in the class struggle and the rightward shift of the labor movement. Middle-class careerists took the workers' place and eagerly embraced these so-called new ideas. If one looks closer at the ideas of identity politics, one can find the ideas of postmodernism all over it.
the rejection of an ability to understand the objective world we live in. The rejection of a so-called grand change of the world. Instead of the revolution, the small groups or the individual struggle against power. The idea that only I can understand my oppression, my reality, and no one else's. As the prominent intersectional feminist Patricia Hill Collins said, she said, uh, no one group has a clear angle of vision. No one group possesses the theory or methodology that allows it to discover the absolute truth. Now, Marxism, or rather what was thought to be Marxism, had already been challenged as a tool of analyzing oppression by the feminists in the 70s. But the Marxism that many left-wingers came into contact with in, the, in this period was not Marxism, but Stalinism. Mm. There was also a tendency in the reformist labor movement to regard the issues of more oppressed workers as less important. basing themselves on the most well-paid workers with the most uh, illusions in reformism. Now the inability of the labor movement to take a lead in the struggle against oppression and the existence of Stalinism that claimed that they had achieved communism in the Soviet Union. Despite not having gotten rid of women's oppression, the state inequality, led to some thinking that Marxism and the labor movement was not the answer in the struggle against oppression. Now this gave an impulse to separatist organizations and a search for new ideas like radical feminism. Mm. Now, one example of how the feminists in the 70s viewed Marxism was a uh, feminist uh, lesbian uh, group in the US. Called Combahee River Collective that in 1977 released a statement. Where they said that they agreed with Marxist theory when analyzing economic relationships.
but that Marxism could not explain the oppression of black women. They said, this focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. And in the end of their statement, they quote Robin Morgan, who said, I haven't the faintest notion of what possible revolutionary role that white heterosexual men could fulfill. since they are the very embodiment of reactionary vested interest power. Now, ironically enough, all these feminists actually borrowed extensively their ideas from Marxism or rather what they thought was Marxism. But just like the other postmodernists, they took those ideas and turned them into their opposite. And the consequence of those ideas is what we see in the movement today. Now, some feminists think that because they focus so much on women's oppression, that means that they are the ones who take the struggle against women's oppression most seriously. But if one has an incorrect idea or an incorrect understanding, then that will lead to a counterproductive strategy. The idealism of identity politics leaves it open to be fooled by the system. If the idea is that we just have to check our privileges, if we just have to struggle against the ideas of sexism and racism, then one can easily be fooled into thinking that real progress has been made simply because a leading politician or even capitalist says that they're feminist or anti-racist. Just like politicians can swear that they take the climate crisis very seriously and then do nothing. Politicians can say that they're for gender equality whilst at the same time attacking women's 
working and living conditions. Companies can initiate small things like all those companies that claim to support Black Lives Matter. Where they can appear to be with the movement, support the movement. All the while exploiting their workers in the same manner as before, profiting from oppression. And if the idea is that women has to be represented by other women, that we need more female leaders, then one can easily be fooled into supporting leaders from an oppressed group, being elected as a party leader or leader of a government. No matter what politics they actually stand for or what class interests they represent. It leaves the door open for class collaboration. In Sweden, one party after another have become feminist since the 90s. Precisely in the period where the gains made in the post-war period were beginning to be rolled back through cuts and pri uh, privatization. Ebba Bush Thor, uh, the leader of the Swedish Christian Democratic Party, She calls herself a feminist. While she's a conservative who would like to curtail the right to abortion. The Liberal Party of Sweden has a black female leader. And she represents a shift to a more open racist profile for that party. Because she wants to bring the party closer to the racist Sweden Democrats. The social democracy that is now in government has claimed that it carries out um, feminist uh, foreign policies. Which apparently means selling weapons to Saudi Arabia that has been used on the war on Yemen. All these politicians, all these party leaders, they use um, labels and their identities as a way to distract from the real policies they carry out. Feminism has become a mass industry in Sweden. where a myriad of academics can thank feminism for their career.
They claim that they're doing an important work against uh, women's oppression through something in, we call in Sweden gender pedagogy in schools and at workplaces. where they challenge gender roles. All these people can lead a comfortable life as part of the establishment. Patting themselves on the back for their commitment against oppression. All the while, the same establishment has torn apart the welfare state once built up. During these past 30 years. What has this official feminism given working women in Sweden? A lie, that's what they're given. And the same can be said of the NGOs in the poorer countries. They've become an industry that allows a small layer of middle-class pe people to lead a comfortable life, whilst all they offer for the masses of poor women is a lot of empty talk and charity. Identity politics is, is not as those who advocate it would claim, a means to make sure that the struggle against oppression is made a top priority of the political leaders. It's a facade these leaders use to cover, in the best case, a lack of action. In the worst case, attacks and austerity. And this is true both for the capitalists the right-wing parties and the labor movement. Identity politics is also used as a way to stifle left-wing and revolutionary elements within the labor movement. by putting forward candidates from an oppressed group as an alternative to left-wingers in the movement. Or by claiming that men take up too much time of the debate or that something they say is sexist or racist. In the British Labour Party, the right wing used false claims of anti-Semitism to attack the left wing.
And as identity politics claims that only those suffering under an oppression can define what that oppression is, You cannot question their claims of sexism or racism. And left wing elements in the labor movement often stand very vulnerable against this sort of attack. because they're so eager to prove that they're against oppression, that they're the best feminists, the best intersectional uh, feminists. So in the Labour Party, many left-wingers simply accepted those claims without question. And we see the same phenomena in protest movements. During the um, Black Lives Matter movement in uh, Sweden this summer, the solidarity demonstrations, a young woman outraged by the police violence and inspired by the movement in the US, decided to spontaneously organize a demonstration in Gothenburg through Facebook. And this was the first political thing that she had ever done. But since she was of Middle Eastern origin and not black, She was immediately bombarded with harassment. That you cannot organize this, you should hand it over to black, black people. Which she did. And at the end, she was so demoralized by the treatment that as far as we know, she didn't even turn up to the demo. This is just one example, but there are many similar or exactly the same examples as this one. Now, Marxists meet those we disagree with through political discussion and debate. We understand that we cannot simply forbid prejudice and pretend that it will all go away if we just shout at or insult anyone that we disagree with. The methods of just shutting down a political proponent, something we usually reserve for fascists or trolls who just want to disrupt political activities. But in the identity political movement, these are methods that are considered to be fair game to be used against pretty much anyone that disagrees with them.
by declaring a boycott against them, bombarding them with hateful comments. demanding that they be removed from their job or position. And this creates a mood of fear and serves to stifle the debate and divide the movement. We denounce all these methods and ideas. We say it should always be the policies that decide what candidate to support. Not their gender, sexuality or color of their skin. Because experiences of oppression is not enough to know how to fight it. And does not give one the right to claim leadership of any movement. One has to know where oppression comes from, why it exists today, to understand how to get rid of it and what know what methods and which demands to put forward in the struggle. That is one has to study history and analyze society. The knowledge in how to fight women's oppression is not something you're born with simply because you're born a woman. You have to learn it. As Marxists, we're not fighting for a minority from an oppressed group to have a career within the capitalist state. We don't fight for the oppressed to be represented by a few individuals. But fight for a communist society with no state where everyone runs society. What we need is not to be equally represented by the capitalists that exploit us. or the politicians that uphold their system. What we need is to destroy the system through its revolutionary overthrow. And what we need is not a myriad of different organizations for different oppressed groups. all carrying out their separate struggles, but a united mass movement of all oppressed under the leadership of a revolutionary labor movement. And though the majority that call themselves feminists and many who favor intersectionality only mean that they want to fight oppression. We 
we do not call ourselves feminists or intersectional Marxists. Precisely because these ideas, no matter in what form you find them in, cannot explain oppression or how to fight it effectively. Now, because the leaders of feminism and intersectionality do not understand the need to end capitalism, to end oppression, they end up adapting to the capitalist system. Not only that, they're also in general reformists or even liberals. Just look at the left party of Sweden. That party likes to view itself as the most feminist party in Sweden. They once campaigned for 200,000 new jobs in the public sector and a six hour working day. Now these are reforms that would have greatly improved the lives of working class women. These demands are nowhere to be seen today. The leadership does not push these demands anymore. Because the party leadership is so eager to collaborate with the social democrats, so they've dropped all the more radical demands to accommodate to them. It's the same with all the other examples as I, as I gave. The left party has become feminist precisely in the same period as they've moved to the right. So our problem with those leading figures of feminism and intersectionality is not that they take the struggle against oppression too seriously. It's the opposite. We say you don't do enough in the struggle against oppression. You're afraid of challenging the system. You don't believe that the workers can overthrow the capitalist system and run a socialist society. You've become convinced that only the capitalists and the politicians can run society. They end up being the same way as all other politicians and capitalists. Who say, don't take to the streets. Leave all your problems in our hands and sooner or later things will get better. We say, take to the streets. 
struggle now against all the ills in society. Struggle now for your full and complete liberation. Struggle now for a world revolution to destroy this barbaric system. To destroy it once and for all, to end all exploitation, injustice, and with it, all forms of oppression. <laughs>